it's really a pleasure to introduce Robin Cotton to you. Um, she is a molecular biologist and biochemist um, who is going to talk about forensic DNA testing. She's now associate professor and director of the Biomedical Forensic Sciences uh, Division at Division De Program at BU uh, School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Cotton's experience with forensic DNA began at Cellmark Diagnostics back in 1988. Um, and she served as the lab director for the Cellmark Lab from 1994 to 2006. Um, in that position, and, and since she's served in a number of high profile cases around the country, um, she's been a, an expert uh, witness in uh, DNA uh, cases, about 200 criminal cases in just about every state in our nation. Um, she also oversees the development and implementation of new techniques for use in the lab, as well as participating in this casework and testifying in court. Um, she is a, an elected member of the Board of Directors of the American Society of Crime Lab Directors and the Lab Accreditation Board for a four-year term, and is, as I said, now Director of the Biomedical Forensic Sciences Program at BU. So please welcome Dr. Robin Cotton. Well, I <clears throat> hope my voice is good. There we go. Uh, I want to thank the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study for putting on such a wonderful series because I got to come to the symposium and it was, if you didn't get there, it was really wonderful. And I would really like to thank all of you. I'm amazed to see so many people who came out on a super cold, snowy night mm -hmm. uh, to hear about forensic science. So we'll talk about that for a little bit and we'll give you a little bit of background. It's not gonna be hugely in depth because we don't have time to do that. And then we're gonna see if I can, I'm gonna see if I can discuss with you some of the things that are difficult about what we do and some of the things that are difficult about what we do just because we're interacting with the legal system. I came to forensic science almost by accident I left a very nice, comfortable postdoc at NIH in 1988 and went to work for a small private laboratory that was in Germantown, Maryland, little ways up the road. At least the traffic was going this way and I was going that way. That was probably the best thing. And I worried about that for a long time because I had left the strictly research environment. And after a couple of years of worrying about it, I never looked back. <laughs> and apart from my wonderful choice of a life partner, that is the best decision I made. It turns out that doing the same thing all the time can be challenging and fun in ways that you wouldn't imagine. Now, these uh, look like maybe pictures we're all seeing crime scene and forensic people on the TV all the time. These are actually pictures of our students at BU. We do use lovely blue lights as alternate light sources to identify where there might be a blood stain or a semen stain or something else. People do stand around behind crime scene tape trying to figure out how they're going to approach whatever's going on, and that's our field space which is over in Holliston. And evidence does arrive in labs in little brown bags with evidence tape on them indicating who opened it on what date and what part of the package was opened. So all of that stuff is real, but most of the rest of the stuff that you see on TV is kind of not real <laughs> or edgy. Could be very edgy, right? So. I would like, so this slide is here just to give you an idea and give me a way to talk about forensic science in general. Uh, the National Institutes of Standards has recently convened about 500 forensic scientists and academic experts to begin to write standards for all of these activities. So you see on your right is biology and DNA, and there we have biological methods, which includes DNA and interpretation of data, and we also have wildlife 
forensics, which is usually species identification, but not always through DNA. And so that's the little, that little wedge is the thing I know something about. Uh, at BU, we also teach the chemistry things, which are explosive, firearms, trace evidence, which is really material science applications, seized drugs, which are, is this powder sugar, or is it cocaine, or something worse, um, and toxicology, what do you, what does this person who didn't make it have in their body? So those uh, disciplines we work with at BU, and we also teach crime scene and a lot of general criminalistics. There are, however, these other things that are very important um, to regular forensic laboratories. One is digital and multimedia, like what does this guy have on his computer? And when did it get there? And what was he doing with it? And there's also pattern evidence, fingerprints, comparisons of tool marks, tire tracks, footwear, things like that. And some of these disciplines are not as sciencey as we would like them to be. And that will be a big part. So right at the moment, DNA does have standards and crime labs have standards. We'll come to another slide about that in a second. But technical standards currently do not exist. There are guidelines in some of these disciplines, but not standards. So this activity at NIST with this 500 or so people divided up into all these different areas is to write technical standards. And in our case of DNA, we will be writing additional technical standards which are, are needed. So just as, again, an overview, most forensic labs are publicly funded. So in Massachusetts, you have the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory, which is under the umbrella of the Massachusetts State Police. And you have the Boston Police Department Crime Laboratory, which is under the umbrella of the Boston Police Department. In addition to publicly funded laboratories, there are private laboratories, ones that do DNA, ones that do toxicology, ones that do digital evidence, and others around the country that may have other specialties. And in addition to that, there are private practitioners and consultants who are also active in the forensic arena. And that kind of covers your, your group and, and where they work. Pra uh, the position of crime laboratories under law enforcement agencies is currently being hotly debated. However, if you say, well, we have a big pool of people here who think that they shouldn't be under, crime la uh, under law enforcement agencies, wedging them out from under the law enforcement agency is a whole nother story because then you're into politics and people don't like to give up the things that they control, right? So if, if that's the direction we should go, it's not going to happen very fast. Now, another really good thing is that most, if I, it's not 100%, but it's close to all crime laboratories are accredited. There are about four accrediting bodies in the US. They all accredit to international standard ISO IEC 17025. Most of them have some supplemental standards that are specific to forensic science, like how do you collect the evidence? How do you keep a proper chain of custody? How do you write a proper report? Things like that that are different for forensic science than for some other activities. And as I said a few minutes ago, right now only DNA and forensic biology have technical standards that are required. And that is because there is overarching leg legis national legislation from 1994 that allows the FBI to have a convicted felon database. And that database is managed by the FBI and only if the lab is accredited and meets these technical standards is the lab allowed to put either evidence or convicted felon profiles up to the database. 
Now, I don't have any slides about that database here, but it's very, very powerful because it really consists of multiple databases. But the two major ones are convicted offenders, one pile over here, and of which there are around 11 million profiles. So we're not talking some little tiny data set. And then over here are the case profiles. These are case profiles from evidence. And so if there's a case that comes up, it can be searched against the, con con the offender database. If no match is made, if a match is made, then that's a huge lead. If no match is made, it can still be compared to the other case profiles. And if it matches some other case profile, then you can connect two cases, and the, then these two police agencies can get together, exchange information, and possibly come to a faster solution for that particular case. Now, let's. We'll leave general forensics for a moment. Let's talk about forensic DNA. In 1985, there were two papers published that really give us the tools that we're currently using. The first of those papers was published by Alec Jeffries, who's now Sir Alec Jeffries from the University of Leicester. And he had one of those aha moments that scientists sometimes get to have where he gets off this autorad, this x-ray film from his experiment, and looks at it and goes, I don't know what went wrong. <laughs> and then has the aha moment of everybody on this film has a different banding pattern. We're visualizing the first individualization of humans across all the people that I have on this thing. It was a fabulous thing because I've, I've done research, I know a lot of researchers, and a lot of stuff like that just goes in the trash. <laughs> and you just go, oh, uh, it didn't work, let me do that again, and he didn't. At the same, in the same year, Carrie Mullis get, uh, discovers PCR develops the method for PCR, which revolutionized all of diagnostics, all of molecular biology, and for which he's received the Nobel Prize not too long after that, because it was such an important tool and allows us to identify some specific segment of DNA we would like to copy, copy it in an exponential form, so from two copies you end up with millions, and then you have enough mass of this material to actually do some chemistry with it or test it in some way. These two things did not come together in forensics until the late 1990s with our current testing. But Jeffrey's discovery was the basis for the early testing, and that was RFLP testing. So what you're looking at here it came from my lab. This is a film that was part of the evidence in the Simpson trial. And so you're looking at these banding patterns. This is the top of the gel, and the DNA migrated down according to size. And then the sequences are uh, identified through radioactive hybrid, uh, hybridization with radioactive probes. It's been a long time since I had to talk about one of these. But these were wonderful to take to court because a six-year-old can do this, right? So here's one known right here. Here's another known, and here's another known. And here's our evidence. Which one does it match? It matches known number two. The evidence in this case is DNA that was extracted from a blood stain on socks in Simpson's residence. And known number two is Nicole Brown. So it's easy. You can explain it. It's not too hard. So, but that was then, right? Now, we have short tandem repeats. And what we're testing are 16 loci, and soon the labs will move to testing 22. So the FBI sort of decides on the panel, 
companies make the kits that have the primers and the tack and the everything to do the amplification. And what we're doing with all these loci are looking at variation in the number of repeats that we have in our DNA. So in this case, this allele has six repeats. This allele has nine. The genotype for this locus is a 6-9. It's nice to see in the diagram. In reality, uh, we're looking at this. So uh, the x-axis here is molecular weight. So these are, this is a lo locus where the alleles have been made by virtue of choosing the primers to be smaller in length. This is longer. And this y-axis is the height of the peak. Now, the peak heights are informative and sort of not perfectly quantitative, but relatively quantitative, which I don't have time to show you later, that, but that does become important when you're looking at mixtures. And so we have four loci here. This one's heterozygous, heterozygous, homozygous, heterozygous. And then these are, all these four are heterozygous and these two. And, oh, and this one is also. So that's what the current data looks like. This is half of a profile, but I wanted to make it big so it would be easy to see. And you might notice that at this locus right here, the two peaks are approximately equal in height. That's a good thing. That's what we expect. We have one copy of each allele. We would like them to PCR exactly the same amount and give us the same height. But we have these other loci where the heights of the peaks are not equal. And this is mainly a problem with the PCR reaction. It's more of a problem when you're using very small amounts of DNA and less of a problem with larger amounts. But what it means is we have to understand what that how big those differences might be so that we know when we're sort of past the normal differences when we analyze data. And so that's the data that's coming down the pike. So the process goes like this, and we're going to have two slides of process, but ultimately if you don't care about the process, you know that you get a profile out at the end. So first of all, evidence is found at the scene. And the scene is messy. Now, I'm not a crime scene person. In fact, I, I probably shouldn't tell you this because you won't think it's so interesting, but I've not been to a crime scene because they're not happy events. And I'm not really sure, I never was really sure that I, that I wanted to go there. Just knowing something about the evidence felt like that was enough to me. Um, you don't, it's like physicians, you don't want to know too much because having the mentality that you're going to get the bad guy is not the mentality that you want. You need to look at that data in an unbiased manner. And so for me, I was never, I, I, I don't want to go, I'm happy with my position. So. Evidence is collected at the scene, br brought into the lab, and then you have to find, well, does it have biological material on it? And so there are uh, relatively fast-acting chemical tests that turn a color or turn black or something that say, I have, I, I have presumptively have blood, or I definitely have blood, or I I, have, I may have semen, or I definitely have semen. And semen, of course, is ultimately identified microscopically because you're going to see sperm. And so at that point, then you're going to take a sample from that evidence. You would always like to save some portion of that evidence for later testing. Because if you don't get anything, uh, maybe you didn't do a very good job and somebody else is going to try. Or maybe you don't have the right technology today, but you're going to have the right technology in five years. If you think about the RFLP film that I showed you a few minutes ago, that took uh, about 500 times more DNA than what we can do today. So if you didn't test it with RFLP and you hung on to it, you can test it now. 
So then the DNA gets purified from the evidence in some manner, goes through a PCR-based procedure to, to say, how much human DNA do I have? Because, of course, these are not nice, clean samples. I used to think, everybody in forensics thinks, oh, we're the only people who have all these messy samples. But you know, that's not true, because people in water quality and all kinds of other disciplines have really disgusting samples as well. <laughs> And so I, I keep telling the forensic people, you're not the only ones. You, you know, other people do this too. And in fact, that's important because there's information in that literature that helps people figure out how to get rid of inhibitors or other things that are a problem. So anyway, then you PCR amplify your DNA, um, run your capillary electrophoresis, and get your profile. And now you're all happy, you have your profile, and now there is a protocol and a set of things that you want to do to think about how to interpret this protocol. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but first you have to recognize what's a peak and what's an artifact. There are artifacts in the PCR, there are artifacts in the capillary electrophoresis. Most of those are very easily diagnosed. You have to understand when does your PCR telling you that you may have lost some data. If you think about that allele that was really short compared to the taller one it was next to, if it got much shorter, it might join the signal that was at the baseline, right? So you can occasionally lose data depending on the amount of DNA that you started with. And then you have to think about how many contributors do I have in this profile? It's very easy to define when you have a single source profile, which is what we looked at. It's more difficult if you have two, but it's doable. If you have three or four contributors, you have now reached a mathematically complicated problem. So we'll talk about that a little in a little bit. And at the end, if you are including a known individual as a possible contributor to an evidence profile, you are required by law and by the accreditation standards to put a numerical weight to that. Is that likely to happen because that profile occurs in one in 100 individuals? Sort of like blood types, right? Think about testing with blood types, 60% of us sort of have O, so they would have included you if you had O, and then you're like, well, wait, that, that, you know, the tons of people have O, but you're still included, right? So you have to put some weight to that profile. Does that profile occur in one in 100 million or 100 billion individuals? Well, then that match is pretty meaningful. But you cannot just say the person is included because that inclusion could range from, range from being included at one or two loci in a profile where that's all the data you have, or it could be an inclusion at 16 or 15 loci in a single source profile where no one else on Earth is likely to have that profile, except, of course, always identical twins. So, in any case. So, I want to talk just briefly about persistent challenges that we have. And one of the first one sounds like, well, why? This shouldn't be hard, right? Recovery of cells from substrates and, and, and the efficiency of the recovery of DNA from cells. If we walk into this room and there's a blood stain over there on the yellow wall, how are we going to get those cells off? Basically, people wet a swab and swab it. Well, you know, that doesn't get them all off. I mean, the more cells we get off, the better um, the amount, the higher the amount of DNA we're going to have, and the more likely we can get a result. So removing cells from a substrate, it might be a wall, it might be a vaginal swab, it might be something else. It matters. And, and cells, it turns out when they're all dried on there, they really don't like to let go. Um, and then we have this balance in DNA efficiency. You can get all the DNA, but it's not really clean, or you can get a portion of the DNA, but it's really clean. And you know, bringing those things sort of more together would be a good idea. And it's something people are working on, but 
uh, those tools actually can still be improved. We need consistent and accurate interpretation of profile results when we have very low amounts of DNA, and it turns out that can be tricky. And then we need prevention of contamination. And I have a story to go along with that, which is not particularly a good story, so not occurring in Massachusetts, triple homicide in a home. A defendant is charged and convicted and in prison on death row. Now, I don't know whether this man is guilty or not, but the scenario is that some DNA testing was done in 1999 with STRs. It's not super powerful, but he visited this home the, the night before the homicide. So now you don't know is the DNA there because he visited or because he did something. So one of the weapons was a cast iron skillet, which broke apart. That's how hard it was used. So the, that, the handle of that skillet was not tested in the original testing. So now the case is going through all the court proceedings and appeals that go with a death sentence. And in 2005-ish, they decide to test the handle of the skillet. They test the handle of the skillet. The handle of the skillet comes up with a single source male profile. And the defendant's attorneys are, you know, and the other people are going, I don't know. Anyway, so they compare that to the database, no match. And they do something that they should do, and they were careful, and they said, well, we need to rule out other people. So they test the lab people. In fact, almost all labs know the profiles of the people working there, which you can imagine would be important for chasing down contamination. It's not the lab people. The single source profile on the handle of the skillet was consistent with the court reporter. The court reporter and others in the courtroom handled the evidence during the trial. And now what you have is evidence that you cannot retest, or even if you retest it and get something, that something is suspect. I mean, it just, you know, for, for people who, like, are really looking for the answer, it just kills you because your opportunity for that answer, because they didn't know. I mean, it's 99. They should have known, but they didn't do it. They didn't do it right. So all of those things matter. Now, if we go back up one second, this consistent bit, we know this is also a problem because the National Institute of Standards sent some complicated mixture profiles out to a lot of labs. Not the, not the evidence, just the paper profiles, like the green and blue one we saw a while ago and asked the labs to use their own protocol so they had evidence and some, you know, fake known people. They asked the lab to compare the evidence to the knowns and write a report. In the best of all possible worlds, right, they would all, they would get back the same report from every lab. <laughs> no, they did not. Not only that, in some labs, there were different reports within the lab. So now we really have a problem. So I'm going to, oh, one slide. So this is just a way to say this is the contamination issue. In my lab at BU, I had a student who picked off the microscope stage 10 cells, put them in a tube. We put in some reagents, didn't, didn't really clean it up any. We can easily, re reproducibly get a profile from 10 cells in a perfect, clean scenario. Typically, you're going to use a nanogram or so. But think about what happens if you have four people in that nanogram. Now you're sort of at low amounts of DNA for all those four people. You don't know in advance how many contributors there are. You can't know that. You, you, you can see it when you get the profile, 
but you can't see it when you're handling the evidence. You might, I mean, if you had, let's say you had a sexual assault and there was a consensual partner, and then you might say, well, you know, it's likely I might see three. But there are pro procedures for trying to separate out sperm from the other cell types that are in that evidence. There, those procedures are pretty good. Um, so maybe in your sperm fraction you might have two, and maybe you can manage that. But um, you, you never know ahead of time what you're going to get. So let's think about, these are just kind of slightly weird cartoons, but they're meant to make a very important point. If I have one contributor, one person, I'm going to either have two alleles that are the same, that person will be homozygous, I'll see single peak, or they'll have two different alleles, they're heterozygous, I see two peaks. That is not difficult to figure out. That's as easy as the Simpson autorad. If I have two contributors, I might have one peak if both people are homozygous for the same peak. I might have two, three, or four. This is half of the combinations that you could have because you have to just reverse them, right? So altogether, there are 14 ways that I can mix up the alleles of two people for each locus to get one, two, three, or four peaks. Now, you can, in most circumstances, kind of sort that out because you might also have more of one person than the other, so the peak heights of one person may be higher than the other, than the second person. And so in a lot of circumstances, you can figure that out. Okay, great. What happens when you go to three? Here's what happens when you go to three. And, and the, these are just sort of the basics. All together, there are 150 combinations of ways that you can put alleles from three people together to get one, two, three, four, five, or six peaks. You cannot sort this out by staring at the profile. No amount of staring at the profile is going to let this come into your head. And yet, my lab and other labs have been trying to do this by hand for a very long time. The concern is, now I'm, I don't have a lab anymore, but so hopefully I would have fixed it by now, right? But the concern is that when people are, so this is just three. Imagine four, right? That gets even worse. And if somebody in here is a mathematician and you have a graduate student and you want them to do a cool problem, I have a problem for you because nobody has really figured out how many permutation and combinations there are for four. Somebody tried, but they gave up. <laughs> I know there's a proper math way to do that, but I tried it and I couldn't do it. In any case, now I want to tell you a, a, a very short, I'll try to make it short story about this, and that is, let's imagine we have the six alleles. And we're just going to call them one, two, three, four, five, six. And let's imagine that the defendant has alleles one and six. Well, that profile has alleles one and six, right? But as it's pictured, Nobody in that particular combination has the genotype 1 in 6. It's the genotype that matters, not whether the alleles are present. And that's what you cannot decipher when you have three contributors. And I was reading a transcript a couple of years ago, and the transcript was not good. And the witness is saying, in relation to the defendant and the mixture profile, his alleles are here. Now, what does that say? It sounds like she knows that the alleles that are the same between the profile and the defendant are actually his. But she doesn't know that. She doesn't know if he might be a 1-6, but she doesn't know the genotypes that went to make up that mixture. So she's saying that. And then pretty soon, the prosecutor is saying, his, I'm just making, his alleles are here. And then on cross-examination, 
the defense attorney starts using that very same language. His alleles are here. That is wrong. That is not OK. Now, every witness knows that they're supposed to make things simple for the jury. But they're simple, and then there's wrong. So all right, now we're going to leave this. And I'm, because I'm getting close to being out of time, these are new things that are coming down the pike. And of these new things, they're all cool and wonderful. The most important right now is the last one, which is software, mathematical modeling software, which is designed to model the peaks in the profile and figure out what the real contributors are. That software works for two-person and three-person and sometimes four-person mixtures. It has limitations. We all know what those limitations are. And that implementation of that software in the last, I would say, year and a half, is it's really picking up. So of the new things, that's the most important. And the others are going to be very cool toys and will help out a lot. But let's move on, because I want to do these things. The intersection, you can be as geeky as you want at school. But you cannot be that geeky when you go to court. It does not work. Now, there are a lot of pressures on laboratories. These are some of them. Crime laboratories have budgets. They have personnel issues. They need to do high quality work. The kits, the, the amplification kits, one kit to run 200 samples costs $4,000. It's not cheap to do this work. And when sequencing comes along, which it is, it's going to be even more expensive. There is no requirement for anything other than a Bachelor of Science degree if you want to do this work, unless you want to be a technical leader, in which case you need a master's degree. Which sometimes when I'm granting somebody a degree, I'm going like, oh my god. <laughs> Please don't let that student be a technical leader. This one over here, good. That one over there, maybe not. Most labs do not have dedicated research staff. And so as the very complicated things come down the pike, they are all going to have some, not all, but a lot of labs are going to have issues. And some labs are huge. You know, They have 100 analysts or 50 analysts. But some labs have four. And validation is required in order to put new things online. So that's important. Also, there's no centra, central repository for validation data. There's no requirement for really serious continuing education. You have to go have eight hours per year or something like that. But you know what happens? You go to a meeting, you sit for eight hours, you get as much as you can, then you go back and you go, OK, I got to do my work now. Right? That isn't staying with you. We need to have a better understanding of how errors happen and how bias affects our judgment when we're interpreting profiles. And we also, and I have a great story to go with this, but I'm not going to tell you because I don't have time. We need to, we need to, well, maybe, anyway, we, we need to do a better job of connecting basic research with forensic science. So the, the quick story was I had a student who wanted to work on a procedure to see if we could get better recovery of DNA from sperm. So I sent him to the library. I said, go up, look at this. Well, it turns out, and this is my fault. I didn't know. That. I mean, it turns out that there is massive amounts of literature on sperm because people want to have babies. I didn't know that massive amount of literature was there. I, I never went and looked at it. And it turns out that when you go look at that and the, all the biochemistry that they now know in developmental biology of how sperm come to be has a lot to do with how we should extract the DNA. And now I was, I mean, it was just mind boggling to me how I had ignored all that information 
for such a long time. And there are many, many other examples of that. There's a lot of research out there that could be applied, but those people don't know anything about forensic science, and the forensic scientists don't know about that research. And there's no real vehicle to get those people together. There's a guy on the BU campus who's doing surfaced enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which is, I can say it, but I can't do it, right? It turns out he has a method for identifying body fluids that he may be able to make a portable instrument and identify body fluids at the scene and say, that is a rust spot, but that is a blood stain. Let's pick up that piece of evidence. I don't even know how he figured out he might want to do that, but he called us up and say, said, did you, you know, do you have people who know these things? And we're like, oh yeah, we have those people. <laughs> so there's very, forensic science is very public. Partly it's because you're going to court. So there's the Simpson trial, the World Trade Center identifications, innocent, innocence projects, exonerations, very important. <clears throat> Everybody's probably read about Annie Duke in thousands of cases. She was being helpful to the police. Very productive. And that lab, I must say, was not accredited. And shame on the Massachusetts, I don't know who it would be. The crime lab was accredited, but this lab, this drug lab was not. So that would have, it might not have caught it at the very beginning, but it would, at, the, at the rate she was doing that, it would have been caught. So you have good days in court. Now you've done your test. You have your data. How things go doesn't just depend on you, but depends on all these players. A good attorney on both sides is worth a huge amount because a good attorney knows what questions to ask, and they should be asking those questions, and the witness should be prepared to answer them. The witness should be prepared to not be defensive and treat the proceedings with respect and understand their role. A bad day in court is when everybody ha is not prepared Nobody's really doing their job. Prosecutors will say to a witness, A, they'll say, I don't have time to pre-trial or talk to you in advance, and B, I'll just ask you a few questions and you just run with it. No, that, that's, that doesn't work because A, if the witness is good, they're still basically on their own that, and, and can't, they, don't, they may not know what the pro, what's most important to the prosecutor. They may, you can't wing it on your own. That is basically the bottom line. You can't be defensive. It's your job to answer the questions. And sometimes the attorneys are obnoxious. And sometimes they yell at you. I've had attorneys call me a liar. Yeah, really. I mean, look at me. I look nice, right? <laughs> It's insulting, but you have to set that aside because your role is to explain what you've got. And if you're all insulted and you're all defensive, you're not going to be able to do that. It's the jury. It's you guys out there that have to decide. It's my job to tell you what that data means and be clear about what it doesn't mean so you can't misinterpret it. Going to court requires communication skills. It requires a lot of patience. You know how on TV it's always fast and, you know, like that? No. <laughs> it is slow as molasses. And the attorneys stumble over it. In, in attorney language, you're doing loci. I don't know why every attorney thinks it's called a loci instead of a loci, but they do. <laughs> You have to have a lot of patience, and you have to have depth in your scientific understanding of what you're doing. It's not called on all the time, but when you need it, it needs to be there. And communicating science to non-scientists is difficult. It takes practice. 
I, I, in the beginning, I would write it out, and then I got, you know, pretty comfortable with testifying, and then we switched to PCR, and I thought, well, I, I really understand PCR. I'll be able to just do it. And the first time I testified about PCR, you would have thought I was speaking a foreign language. I mean, nothing came out right. It didn't make any sense. No person could have understood what I said. And I promptly went home and said, OK, well, you got to write this out and practice it so that it you know, makes some sense. And sometimes it's just hard. Labs make mistakes. People make mistakes. You have to answer to those mistakes. You cannot just go, it's not my problem. If you have something to say and it's not positive about yourself or your laboratory, you just have to say it in a voice that's matter of fact and speaking the truth. So I have one slide, which is my favorite slide, because it's a quote from Einstein. And I think it speaks to lots of people, but it especially speaks to forensic scientists. The right to search for the truth implies also a duty. One must not conceal any part of what one has recognized to be true. If you have an inconclusive result, that's it. That's all. If somebody's, if you're not sure, you say so. If your lab made a mistake, you say so. You can do, you know, a good witness will do that. And it's a privilege to be able to do this work. It's fun. It's nice to do good science and then find people who are excited about it. Because the lawyers are always like, this is super cool. Um, testifying is mostly OK. And thank you for having me.